Hello Australia, welcome to My Millennial Money, I'm Glenn James and today on this Super September episode, yes it is still Super September, we are talking about Super all of September, so if you're listening in April 2021, you missed it but you can still get some nuggets of super wisdom. Now today on the podcast, it's just me and a dear friend of mine and the My Millennial Money family, Glenn Hare. G'day Glenn, how are you? Very well, how are you Glenn? Mate, I am good. Thanks for coming up to the sunny, sunny coast. No worries, thank you for having me. It is your pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I sound like a dick when I say that? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, that's right. Yeah, that's we'll let it fly. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but hey, we can't sit here today without help from our show partner, Sun Super. Uh, Sun Super, they've got a very strong and competitive investment performance history. Mm. Their balanced option has beaten the industry average over one, three, five, seven, and 10 years. And yes, the source is Super Ratings. And um, yeah, they also won the Super Ratings 2020 Fund of the Year Award. Pretty solid. Yeah. Now, you are a financial advisor and we'll we'll talk about your journey soon. Mm. But I often, I like to kind of you know, without uh, threatening any commercial agreements, um, you know, if the line's there- This already sounds a bit worried. Yeah, that's right. If the line's there, I'll jump over the line. But, you know, when comparing your super yeah. or looking at other options in the market, yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm not hanging my hat on a one or three year return totally. because we don't need the money for at least 40 years. Mm. So let's look at how the funds have performed over five to 10 years. Yeah. Is that a fair comment? <clears throat> yeah. So for me, like looking at per, my personal super and even when looking at our members super, um, usually it's the 10 year period because most of our, our members aren't retiring like me for 20, 30, 40 years. So it is kind of that long-term trajectory that we're looking at. I don't know about you, Glenn, but do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling myself that. <laughs> so are you ready to have a chat about, uh, we're going to talk about your story, yep. uh, the gay thing, the corp thing, yep. all that stuff. All the stories. Let's do it. <laughs> so Glenn, I, I did want to get you on for a, a couple of reasons uh, and I think it's probably been over a year since we've tried to organize this. It has. Uh, and the Mercury and Venus has like, it's aligned and you're here. But I did want to talk about LGBTQI+, I think I missed the letter up there. but No, you nailed it. Uh, awesome. Uh, like money matters in that part of the community. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about your journey uh, coming out in the corporate world. Yeah. Uh, and then your journey, I guess, coming out of corporate, yeah. and don't excuse the pun, into your own <laughs> business. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, so I don't know how you want to... Um, unpeel this onion yeah but maybe let's let's actually let's just go what right off script yeah let's just throw that <laughs> okay. oh wait there's more there than um and let's just talk because i work better when i'm just chatting chilling cool perfect let's talk about your money experience mm. growing up mm. uh, and what your first memories uh around money was mm. and maybe growing up and yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so my money, my relationship with money was very much shaped by my parents. Um, one told me, one kind of showed me how to manage money. The other one showed me very much what not to do with, with money. So my dad was terrible with money, loved cars. So oh, he's a champion, <laughs> <laughs> which cost him a lot of money. And my mom did not like cars. So yeah. that was a bit of a challenging uh, thing for their, for their relationship. But anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, so he really showed me how to waste money and what, what not to do. He was, he was traditionally kind of penny wise, pounds foolish, right? So, you know, he'd eat a 30 cent cone instead of getting, I think they're 50 cents now, instead of getting the chocolate sundae, which was $2 at Macca's because he wanted to save the dollar fifty, but would then go out and buy a brand new Mercedes. Are you talking about me or your father? <laughs> Are you my father? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then mum was the complete opposite. Really, you know, thought about money, uh, really, you know, fairly conservative, um, was always kind of planning for the future. And, and I probably... Um, 
swayed towards my mum's mindset in that I, I used to get pocket money every week and I used to save that. And I actually, I've got five brothers and I actually used to lend my pocket money to my older brothers at interest when I was in kind of primary school. Um, And they would pay it because they didn't want to go down the road to get money out or whatever the case may be. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I've always been kind of fairly fairly good with with money, I'd say. Where did you grow up? Uh, Northern Beaches, Sydney. Yeah, great. So, I guess in terms of your upbringing, um, middle Australia, nothing too scandalous, um, weren't on a current affair for doing anything dodgy, like no... So just run of the middle. Pretty low key, pretty chilled, mm. no dramas. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're a financial advisor now. Yeah. Uh, you weren't always. Uh, you've been around the money world uh, for some time. Yeah. Was that something uh, like you were lending money at interest as a five-year-old, you freak. <laughs> uh, was it in your heart to do something with money as a career? I think so because I always saw I'm not necessarily driven by money, but I always saw it as the enabler to mm. do what I what it is, whatever I wanted to do. Yeah, and I think money it's actually just a tool. Yeah. And you know, I've got a um a saw, you know, yeah. in the garage behind this, well we're in my garage, but in the garage part of the garage. Uh that tool, that saw, I can cut some nice timber with or I can go and cut someone's arm off. So tools can be abused. <laughs> That's is a that a super bad analogy? dramatic analogy? But, yeah, but yeah. we got there, didn't we? <laughs> we got there in the end. Yeah. So, <laughs> so all money, money doesn't know anything. It's just a tool. Yeah. And that saw to one person could be one thing, and the other person it might not be anything. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, I, look, I think about this personally, but also the members that we work with um, at, at the, our business. It's um, it's it's about it enables them to do what it is that they want to do in life, whatever that may be. Yeah, yeah. Now, talk about, um, you know, it's not necessarily a money story, but I think it's it's part of you and yeah. your, your story. So, did you, like, was there a defining age where, because I, I just, I guess as a sidebar for everyone and hello if you're watching on YouTube, I like to use this platform for good and every time we get on this uh, microphone on the podcast, we just want to encourage you in as many ways as we can. Now, uh, Glenn's story might resonate with you and I hope it does encourage you if you've got some feelings or trying to find yourself or work out who you are. So, yeah. that's just a sidebar. Was there like, oh, I'm 12 years old, I'm pretty sure I'm gay or did yeah. it come up and surprise you at 24 when you were someone, I don't know. What so the- you want to hear the whole coming out story and Let's how did it all it. come out? Okay, yeah. cool. So um, was there kind of a defining moment? Um, probably not a defining moment, but definitely when I suppose I was hu- at high school and hormones, like all teenage boys running wild, I guess I was just a bit confused. Because I was like, I don't know if I like girls. I don't know if I like boys. I, don't really, I had girlfriends because I thought that was just what you what you do. Yep. Um, and I didn't really have, I, well, I did not have any gay friends. I didn't know any gay people. So I almost felt quite alone. And even thinking about um, this might be a little bit controversial, but even seeing Mardi Gras on TV, I found quite challenging because I was like, oh, I'm not really... Like I don't wear glitter, I don't have any, um, you know, fairy wings or anything like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that was kind of my only exposure to the LGBTI community. Yeah. So I was like, it's oh, like not all that. or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And all I saw was the all. Um, so I was like, oh, that's that's not really me. What's what's kind of going on? Um, so all through high school, high school, I was in the closet, um, and then I actually started Macquarie Bank uh, when I was nineteen, still still studying. Because how old are you now? I am 30, 33. Yeah, I had to think about that. I know it's wild, isn't it? <laughs> thirty three, so pretty old. Yeah, um, you're but- done, washed up. <laughs> done, washed up, what's my super doing? Yeah. <laughs> um <clears throat> being super September and all. Yeah, totally. Um I was just like, oh, I don't really know if I should start my corporate career with this almost another kind of barrier. Mm. Um so I decided to start when I was nineteen in the closet, which was, you know, every time you opened the um, you know, the elevated doors, you, you had to really change the conversation. When you, you know, rather than saying, Oh, I went to a gay bar on the weekend or I went to the beach with my boyfriend or whatever it might be <clears throat> It was always, oh, I went to the beach or oh, I went to the pub. 
you just always had to make sure that you were kind of changing mm. changing that narrative. Uh, and it took me probably about – so I was at MacBank for 10 years and being a big organisation, you move around kind of different roles, different areas and I, I took a point where I changed divisions, completely new office building, completely new team, nobody knew me and I took that as the point to kind of when, – when I was having that, you know, water cooler conversation yeah, to say – I, I, I was at the, I was at, you know, I was at, um, you know, Wicked with my mum, or I was at, I just saw the sound of music, or yeah. you know, I was at the boy, I was at the the beach with my boyfriend, or whatever the case may be. So then, obviously, as soon as something like come that comes out on day one, day two, everyone knows on the floor, and that was kind of it for me. Yeah. Um, but before doing that, it was pretty lonely, and you definitely had to watch app filter absolutely everything you say. Ten years <coughs> ago, would you say? Uh, corporate Australia wasn't gay friendly Mm. and do you think it's changed 10 years later? Um, So I never had a negative experience um, in in my corporate life but I believe it is definitely far better um, um, now than than it was with things like, you know, obviously marriage equality, organizations like Wear a Purple, Out for Australia, Pinnacle, like, uh, you know, Pride and Diversity. These are organizations that are making, um, you know, just educating people on the LGBTI community. So you were 19 years old. Um, you had, I guess this sounds really bad, but I'm trying to explain it to myself. You would come out internally. Yeah if that's a word. If not, it is now. Yeah. Um, and then stage one, I would assume it might be the family. No. So stage one was my two best mates. Yeah, right. Um, so I kind of set this date that I had to tell them. Yeah. And went to the pub where all, you know, good conversations I had after a few drink, drinks, built up the courage. And I was like, guys, I've got to tell you something. Um, and they were, and I was like, do you have any idea what it is? They had no idea. And I was like, do you have any idea? Like really pushed it. And one of my mates said, oh, you've been going to Thailand a lot. Um, my my brother lived there for seven years. So I was going and seeing yeah. him and he was like, oh, do you have a, do you have a Thai girlfriend or something? Wow. <clears throat> Which was not the case. I was like, no, that's that's not the case. But um, yeah, told them. They were like, yeah, cool, whatever, mate, don't care. Um, and they're like, oh, now you tell me kind of kind of pick it up a bit. <laughs> um, so they came, came around to it pretty quickly. And then I, um, yeah, told my parents after that. And the thing is, I didn't really tell anybody else, but I said, I'm so happy for you guys to tell everybody. Yeah. Because it's really draining just kind of going over and over and over and over again, kind of telling yeah. this story that is broadly irrelevant for most people. Mm. Um, whereas if everybody just knew, it would just be a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the friends, like... So I guess it's safe to say in your friendship group when you were 19, there probably wasn't a gay person or no. in your extended – because Northern Beaches, a bit of a surfy culture. Yeah, and that made it challenging because I didn't just didn't see any role models or leaders that, that kind of mm. uh, looked or felt, felt like me. And your brothers were cool with it? Yeah. yeah. Every, I've, I've been fortunate, and this isn't for everybody, in that um, both in my professional and personal lives, everyone's been really made up broadly a non-event, which – Really is what it should And be. I think like any big event in our lives, and it could even like, you know, it's a money podcast. We'll swing it back to money for two seconds. Mm. If you said to your friends, oh, hey, I'm buying a house. If that friend got out their nose out of joint and we're being a jealous little bitch to you or whatever. Yeah. Well, thanks. I needed to know what you're actually like. 100%. So I think we all go through these things and events in life where, you know, family might get pissed off or whatever and mm. they'll come back around. But I think it's a good sieve for your friends sometimes when mm. you go through stuff. Yeah. I think we just need we need to call out though that everyone has very different experiences. So I was quite fortunate mm. in mine. There's, you know, there's still, uh, you know, a number of people in within kind of the broader community that, that aren't okay with it. Mm. Um, and I, I'm a firm believer in that that's just a lack of education and kind of awareness. But there's a lot of young people that, that are still struggling. Can I ask you a weird question? 100%. Um, I, you know, society tells us one thing that, you, you know, you work a nine to five job or whatever. Mm. I still feel, and like I'll be completely honest, it's unrelated to sexuality, but I still feel guilty sometimes that like yesterday afternoon, I stopped working at 
lunchtime or whatever and then do something that's like feel guilty that I'm not doing this. Like mm. do you ever have this, even if it's a one percenter feeling of weirdness that's from a, the past or the society that's on you still that mm. – or is it actually, no, this is actually who I am and I actually feel better and it's okay? Um. I'll answer that in a kind of a roundabout kind of way because we we spoke about oh well what you know what but I guess firstly out? do you under I guess do you understand what I'm kind of yeah, saying like I the think, societal pressure can stay with us longer even if we've changed yeah so I think about this concept of coming out yeah there you know I choose to come out or not to come out every single day yeah right like when I'm ordering my coffee or you know when I'm booking a hotel or when I'm getting into a cab or whatever I'm doing I can frame my response to questions, I can frame my uh, my conversation based on whether I feel comfortable in that environment. In that environment, yeah, okay. Um, and if I don't, or I feel that they may not be comfortable with who I truly am, then I will frame the conversation that way. Yeah. So I guess, and it's, it's, yeah, there sometimes you can sense a societal pressure that it's not worth my drama going there. Correct. For this two minute encounter. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which is a bit um, crap, yeah. but it's, it's just to avoid, you know, well, it's that any confrontation totally. or challenge or unnecessary kind of stress. Yeah. Just it, yeah. you kind of ignore it. Yeah. If there was somebody listening, cause I want to talk to you about your transition out of corporate life mm-hmm. and then what you're doing now with Jess. Um, if, you know, if there was a young person or old person, like we've got listeners that are 60 year old, we've got listeners that are 14 years old. Yeah. Like if there was someone going through what you went through, yeah, what would you say to them? You're not alone, first and foremost. Um, and an organization that I did quite a lot of work with um, out for Australia is a really good organization that is made up of mentors and mentees, does do a lot of work with with corporates and really focusing on regional as well. But it's it's about creating that mentor-mentee relationship. So then they've got someone that can feel quite lonely because it can be quite a lonely place, has someone to talk to. So yeah, that's out for Australia or, or Pinnacle. Pinnacle organization is also a fantastic organization. Would you say that, you know, if you've got a, so, so like my best friends, I'm probably closer with them than some of my family. Yep. Or other people might be really tight with their family more than their friends. Mm. Would you say one step, get the most, I guess, bankable support you can get just for that little, yeah, I did the first step and that was, I've got that base support. Yeah. Now I can go or. That's what I did. Yeah. And that worked for me. Yeah. So I went to my friends first just because. I just, it's easier at kind of 19 or 20 to have a conversation with your mates than your, than your mum about something like this. And their reaction was exactly what I wanted, which was like, don't care, whatever. Um, and then once I had that kind of support, I then took the next step to my parents, which they, um, dad was shocked. Mum was like, knew all along, um, <laughs> as mums probably yeah. always do. Um, but again, it was a fairly positive response from, from there as I've well. I've got the worst gaydar on the planet. Do you know the truth is so do I, really? which is quite ironic. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. usually have no idea. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it just shows I'm uh, pretty useless at something. <laughs> also, whatever, right? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Now, so you were um, you were working at MacBank. Yep. And you know things were progressing there with your career, mm-hmm. and like I guess I'd say most of us, we get to our later 20s and think what the hell am I doing in yeah. my life yeah. um, some of us <laughs> what does do life it. mean yeah um, so talk to us about you know being in corporate because I couldn't do corporate I just I can't do it yeah what how was the exit out of corporate and how did you do it and what are you doing now and then we'll swing around to maybe talk to some of the uh, money issues that you find uh, within the LGBTQI plus community, yep, uh, and also your other members, yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, at Mac Bank for ten years, um, always in the advice industry, kind of the wealth wealth management industry, but never as an advisor. Um, and that's actually where I met my business partner Jessica Brady, um, and really we just saw 
an opportunity to work with a very different demographic to who was typically seeing seeking financial advice. Uh, if you know, and I set a very hard kind of date, so I hit ten years. I made director. I got paid out my long service leave, and I turned thirty. And I, I we, we planned that for about two years before before leaving. And look, I actually I loved my time at Macquarie, and I'm not just saying that. I genuinely enjoyed my time there. However, I was passionate about, you know, Jess and I were passionate about doing something quite, quite different. So we launched uh, Fox and Hare Financial Advice uh, just over just over two and a half years ago, um, and it has been a roller coaster, um, but a really exciting one in that in terms of the way that we we position ourselves. So we work with a very different demographic. So if you look at the advice industry, average age of an advisor is fifty five. Most people don't seek an advisor until you're like five years from retirement. Seventy eight percent of the financial advisors are men. So Jess and I kind of took a step back, and we were both business development managers at the time, looking after regional New South Wales, going out to you know. Dubbo, which is like five hours, you know, west of Sydney, and when you're in the car that long with someone, you're like, well, "What's what's going on? What's yeah, what's yeah. next steps?" And that's when we kind of took a step back and said, "You know, what about who who is servicing everybody else? Because every advisor that we're 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 meeting with is really just working with those pre and post retirees." Yeah, and the traditional, and this is like, I would just encourage, and I know it to be true for myself, and you'll probably know this for your members. Mm. Seeing a financial advisor, it's not actually seeing them for that once-off gold nugget mm. bit of strategy. Mm. Sure, you need that at age 55. You need that at age 60 all day long. It's that accountability, quarter on quarter, month on month, whatever you want in your world, do you have someone to encourage you with your money and keep you on track? Totally. One of our best referral partners is a personal trainer. Yeah. Because his clients, they need that accountability. They can go to the gym. They can, you know, you look at YouTube clips or whatever, but they want someone that is going to be in their corner mm. to get them up at 6 a.m. To, to run them around the block or whatever. Yeah, like when about. YouTube first started to really take off 10, 15 years ago, mm. everyone was like, oh, well, the bloody yoga industry is dead and the yeah. Pilates is... No, because we still need someone yelling in our face. Totally. I actually, I'm not much of a yeller, nah, but it's so funny because <laughs> I do Pilates when I'm not unable to because of all my ailments. <laughs> I've had a rough trot, people. And then I'm like the only one in the class. There's like four or five people in the class. I actually like, I say to Robert, I'm like, I hate this. And they all think I'm like, like joking. Yeah. It's like, no, I actually hate Pilates. Do you really hate it? Yeah. Why do you go? Because it feels good after. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, fair call. <laughs> well, I actually, I hate going. <laughs> I hate working out. I hate you when you tell me to do the freaking little pulse things. <laughs> I hate it. It's good for your core. It is. <laughs> anyway, I don't know, whatever. Um, but yeah, so you might hate, this is the accountability thing, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Anyway. And, and that's the thing, like you, you, you're 100% right. Like just putting a strategy in place and going, oh, this is going to solve the next 50 years of my life is probably not going to cut it. Mm. Like, you know, things will change. There, there may be a family, there may be travel, there may be starting a business, there may be job changes. So a couple of things that you said there that I picked up on mm. and I'd encourage anyone, if you're maybe 30 years old, 29 years old, 28 years old, pick a number and you've got a dream to do something else. It wasn't an overnight thing. You mentioned two years. Yeah. It was a, it was a long burn. Yep. You were prepared. I'd imagine you would have a bit of a war chest. Yep. Because 100%. it's not easy to start a business from scratch. Uh, did you do it with any debt or was it self-funded? Self-funded, which to your point is why there was such a kind of a, 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 lead a long time. lead time. Yeah. Because we needed to get our personal finances sorted. Yeah. So then when we did move, um, you know, quit our really good corporate roles mm. um, to earn nothing mm. on day one, we needed to make sure that we could still, you know, pay the bills and all of that. Because is there any worse vibe than the vibe of desperation on somebody yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and we didn't want that and we didn't yeah. want to have to cut corners when we yeah. started the business and look i'm an accountant by trade so i'm a pretty strict oh, are you yeah don't oh. hold it against me <laughs> i usually don't tell might wrap this up to go <laughs> yeah Jess, my business partner, was like, it's it's all right. It's a secret. He doesn't like to tell people yeah. when he's accountant. Um, but yeah, I'm a pretty structured, organized person 
by nature. So I knew the specific date that I was going to be leaving and I knew we knew exactly how much we needed in order to kind of set the business up. And on that, um, you know, you had a business partner and you do have one. Um, often if you get two people that are the same skill set, mm. one's probably not needed. Mm-hmm. So talk to us about your unique differences that you both bring to the table. Jessica Brady, my lovely business partner and I are the... And which one's the fox? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, it is her, believe yeah. it or not. Because you're um, a bit foxy, Glenn. Thanks, man. I appreciate yeah. that. You're welcome. Um, yeah, boy, now I've lost my train of thought. I'm getting all hot under <laughs> the, the collar. Yeah, the... <laughs> So um, my gaydar's that bad. Yeah. I had a guy hit on me <laughs> yeah. at a conference once yeah. and I went and told these other people, I'm like, oh, he's really friendly. We got on like a house on fire. Yeah. <laughs> We're going for drinks. He's gay. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. That's that's off the record kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, You're talking about her yeah, unique, Jess, Jessica Brady. Jess and I are so yeah. different, right? And that's, that's something that um, we are both really thankful for. Like it, we think about the business and, you know, we openly say that if I started Fox and Hair myself, I'd get it off the ground, but it'd be a really boring business. Mm. It'd be very same, same. Jess, if she tried to start the business, She'd have all these amazing ideas, but it'd never get off the ground. Yeah. So often and it's it's me saying, Hey, no, we need to focus on this stuff. Mm. But then it's me her pulling me out of my comfort zone saying, Hey, no, we've got to do some of this fun, uh, you know, ideas dif- to differentiate ourselves. And it's this constant back and forth that enables us to build a business that we're both really, really proud of and kind of push the boundaries. Yeah. And one thing that I really like what you did from day one. And a lot of you who listen to the podcast, who are in the Facebook group and on the email list and all that stuff, you'll often see, I'll put out a, a survey and just ask some questions like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? You know, before we launch a new podcast, we'll survey, you know, thousands of people just to get a bit of a vibe. Mm. You kind of did that from day one. Talk yeah. to us about the focus groups because I think it's so encouraging to build something yeah. that people actually want rather than, Oh, I think I, they want this. Yeah. And people find this mind blowing mm. that we ask people what they want. <laughs> yeah. Like, why would you start a business and not yeah. stress test yeah. what you're building? Yeah. Well, you might think it's really good, but, 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 but that, you know, they may have different views or opinions and mm. um, things to, to kind of add. And yeah, you're right. So we had a number of focus groups and we had a room full of, um, you know, typically people in their kind of early 30s and basically just shared with them, open book, this is what we're thinking. And we got their feedback. And to be frank, a lot of the feedback um, just reinforced what we were already thinking, probably about 70, 70% of it. Um, but 30% of it, we were like, we did not think of that. We never, yeah. we never, you know, we never considered that. Um, and we continue to do that. So that wasn't just a one-off all the time. Um, so Charlotte from our business was on the phone to, um, I think about 10 members over the last month. So 10 members that have recently come on board to talk about their experience, what they enjoyed, what they didn't, you know, what, what could have been better, what could we improve on, what, what did they remember, like really remember about that kind of initial experience um, and having that conversation with Charlotte as opposed to our advisors also enabled them to have probably a bit more of an op- open, honest conversation. Yeah. So we take all that and then embed it into um, our new systems and our new process to con- to ensure that we're constantly improving. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So I think what we might do, we'll take a quick break. Mm-hmm. I need to grab a drink of water. Mm-hmm. We'll come back. We'll talk about um, challenges that you're finding with your members, particularly part of the LGBTQI plus community, mm-hmm. your other members, and I might just bring some other random questions on you. 100%. All right. Sounds good. So you've got a business in the middle of Sydney, basically. Yep. Talk to us about your main type of clients. And I know you don't just do one segment, but Mm -hmm. what do you look for in a client or who are you mainly serving? Yeah. Um, So all of our members are aged between kind of 25 and 45. Probably about 80% of them are in their 30s, which kind of get to a point where they're like, all right, I'm actually earning okay money now. I probably should make smarter financial decisions. Yeah. Um, And... 95% 95% of them would be working for a large corporate, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. And what about the profile? Like how many uh, are gay? How yeah. many are maybe gender diverse or... Yeah. 
So we have, um, so we definitely have quite a number of people from the LGBTI community. Jess, uh, one of the other advisors, she um, gets a lot of young women reaching out to her. Um, but yeah, it, it is really broad. One of the, the main things that we, we really focus on is ensuring that there is a really inclusive and non-judgmental environment. Yeah. So you just straight up to trying to tap into that pink dollar. Pink dollar, that's it. And we are, our, our <laughs> office is in Darlinghurst and there's a lot of pink dollar. Around. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's great. But on that, like, so you're in Darlinghurst, yeah. you know, the middle of a vibrant city. Yeah. Um, do you have any like clients that are, you know, I'm a builder in Penrith or... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we've got um, tra- uh, we've got like people in the, uh, in the mines in Queensland. Uh, we've got you know a law- lawyers over in WA. Where it, it the thing that we focus on is again I, I keep coming back. It's that inclusive environment. Yeah. So because financial advice typically can be very exclusive. If you're not an old white man, then it's not for you. Mm. Mm. Whereas we're we're about okay. Well, let's create a safe environment for people in their thirties to have an honest conversation. Yeah, and I mean, you know, if you are a, a a financial advisor and you're listening, if you are a mortgage broker and you're listening, if you are an accountant and you're listening, if you're a lawyer and you're listening, if you're in a a job or a role, you need to make your environment as safe and as inclusive as possible. I always had tissues in uh, my office, mm-hmm. and because. What you kind of find, we get to see behind the veil of a lot of people's lives, okay? And, you know, the amount – I say this jokingly, but I also say it seriously. Um, I've caused four divorces in my financial planning career. Right. Like, not personally, but – You've been busy. I've been very busy, Glenn. (laughs) Very busy. But I guess – and what I say is we create an environment mm. and there's a third party there and I just put a challenge out. Okay, so what about this? What about this? Mm. One will cry. The other one might huff and puff and mm. blow up, you know, blow up. Yeah. Um, and many times with a relationship, I've I've actually said to people – I don't think we can go further with any type of financial plan until you guys resolve this. And me, I actually, I don't mind whatever way you do. I just need you both to be on the same page. And it's a very vulnerable uh, environment to be in. And it's um, it's probably, is it bad that I said I caused four divorces? I don't know. <laughs> That's all right. But I mean, it's just, but that was the reality. Like, yeah. Money's emotional. Yeah, and, and people. If it, have, and I guess if it wasn't me asking the hard questions, it yeah. probably would have happened three years later. Yeah, one of the biggest financial decisions you will ever make is your life partner. Mm. And if if your values aren't aligned, then the way that you manage your finances is not going to be aligned, which is going to cre- create tension. Uh, one again, another referral partner of ours is she's a relationship therapist. And a lot of the conversations she has with her clients or her patients, she's like, if they just got their financial stuff sorted, they would be far happier because they'd actually be on the same page and working towards the same oh, thing. I, I've said to many people who have uh, messaged our Instagram, who I used to meet with, I'm like, I'm sorry, but it's actually not a money problem. It's a relationship problem. Yep. You just, you know, that's exactly what it is. You get on the same page. And I think 99% of your problems will be solved. Yeah. And like we were kind of talking about earlier, money is a means to an end and it's also what enables you to kind of do what you want to in life. Mm-hmm. If you do, if you and your partner have specific goals that you're both working towards, unless you're on the same page in terms of how you're going to get there, then it, one, it's very hard to uh, achieve them if, if you're not. And two, if you don't achieve them, then how happy are you going to be more broadly? Yeah. Your, I forget your partner's name. Liam. Liam, that's right. I haven't asked this, but I will. Can yeah. I ask like... Anything you like. He won't mind. Yeah. What's like... So how in a same-sex relationship, Yep. at the end of the day, it's still a relationship. Yep. Um, are there any unique things that you've both found that... Um, you've had to navigate that you haven't seen with other members and clients? Um, in our personal relationship, um, not really. 
Um, it's for, for us at the moment, it's, it's, it's that kind of hasn't weighed in on any of our decisions, but thinking about our members more broadly within the LGBTI community, um, there are considerations. So, you know, for example, starting a family, mm. there is an added layer of complexity, uh, because the birds and the bees don't work quite the same way in the LGBTI community. Um, so if it's two guys, it might be looking at surrogacy or it might be looking at adoption. And, um, you know, again, if, if, if it's two women, it, it, it's looking at alternatives um, to, you know, work out ha, ha, how does that kind of play out. Um, and there's costs associated with that. So, you know, thinking about the financial implications of that, you know, going through um, surrogacy can cost potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. Really? Really? Um, you know, yeah. And going through IVF multiple times could, you know, adds up. Add up I'm thinking like analysis. the IVF thing is like, yeah, have 30 grand in the kitty ready to go. Like, But if you need to do it multiple times. Yeah. And it, 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 there's just even in terms of, um, you know, corporates and how they, they, they structure. Is it maternity leave? Is it, you know, parental mm. leave? How, how they approach that also, also needs to be taken into account. And, and another personal question, like mm. as a, a gay male... Mm -hmm. um, in a relationship, like, have you both resolved that children are not for us and that's done or is it we're agnostic at the moment? He's smiling. What are yeah. you doing? <laughs> so this is something every time Liam sees a baby, he's, he's, he's grinning at me. He's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first, everyone. <laughs> um, and look, so children is something that we're, you know, actively talking about. Yeah. Um, the business, so Fox and Hare is still so young. So I'm like, you know, that that is that is our baby at, at the mm. moment. Uh, in years, but but you know, his uh, something that he constantly brings up, which is a which is a valid argument, is it's not as easy for us just to fall pregnant and have a baby. It is a process. You need to plan. You need to kind of work towards that. So his argument is, okay, let's get it started now. How old's Liam? He is 31. Yeah. Okay. So you're basically the same age. Yeah. So it's it's almost like, you know, if a child did arrive, whether it's surrogacy, mm. foster program, then adoption, or yeah. I don't know, I'm not skilled in this area, but is it like, well, who will be the full time parent? Yeah. I mean, I mean that that should be the same, and it, it, that's kind and, of starting to be a broader conversation exactly, in all yeah. relationships. Absolutely, now. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, for for I guess a straight couple, it's you know the, the lead time may not be as long. And mm. what I mean by that is, you could say, oh yeah, we're going to have a baby in the next kind of one to two years, and and plan broad broadly around that, which can be overwhelming in itself. But if we've got a plan for something that maybe a, like a five year goal, mm. like that's and I guess that's more why I, I asked how. <laughs> Have you resolved that no, it's not for us? Yeah. And we moving on or yeah, we're a bit agnostic, we'll just vibe it out. Or, we're probably the latter. So yeah. we're just vibing it out at yeah. the moment. Yeah. He's vibing probably more than I'm vibing at yeah. the moment. But we'll see how we go. But it's <laughs> and again, it, it, it doesn't matter if you're gay or not, the older you get, it's like, well, do I want to be uh fifty two years old chasing around a kid? Correct, yeah. Um, and that will probably be me because I'm not emotionally strong enough at the moment to even <laughs> consider a child. All in good time. It's heavy days. So in terms of – it is super September. Mm. Uh, everyone's – and this is funny. It's like I kind of make jabs in Facebook groups. Everyone's like, oh, I need an investment account. It's like, oh, if only we all had an investment account that was for the long term already set up. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean – how much of a focus do you put on super with a new member? Yep. Um, and again, we, we're all not just throwing every cent in super because it's locked up for the long term. Yeah. But, you know, in a, a progressive advice practice with some progressive people running it and some progressive clients, um, yeah. it's, it's certainly a good thing. Yeah, 100%. Uh, how, how is it framed in the advice world in, in your world? So, in, so no one really reaches out to Fox and Hare and goes, I 
I really want to get my super sorted. I'm re- retiring in 40 years. Yeah. Please help me. They're not your client. They're too boring. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'd love Sorry for someone for to come yeah. to me and say that, but that is not what's front of mind. Sorry, no, so I love you. We put a lot more focus on it than they had probably originally thought is, in, is important. But when you show them projections and say, hey, if you got 1% extra performance yep. over... 30 years, yeah. this is where you'll be as opposed to what your existing fund has returned over the last 10 years, then they're like, oh, 1% and that is the difference. Mm. Then you can see the light bulb moment going, mm, this is my money. I should probably do something. Or about even it. it's like, okay, so you've got a grand spare a month. What if you just put 200 in a month? Yeah. Tax efficient, growing for the long term. Totally. And I kind of, I think I said on one of our first episodes on Super September, Mm. um, you know, a lot of us have our death and TBD cover and maybe a bit of income protection funded through Super. I mean, if anything, once you've got your debt cleared and you're on a a running track and maybe you've got that big rock of buying your first home sorted, if anything, maybe we're salary sacrificing just the insurance. Yep. Uh, as a starting point. Yeah. When it comes to, to super, the, where the conversation starts with all of our members is let's actually do an audit mm-hmm. of what you currently have. Yeah. Like what you've been, you know, you're 30 years old, you've been you know, contributing into this fund for the last 10 years. What's it done? Yeah. Well, where is your money invested? Yeah. Um, how much are you paying in fees? Are the investments in line with your values? And then we go, okay, well, this is what it's done. Hey, here are some different alternatives. And this is what it could mean for the longer term. You need, you know, we, we find the most powerful conversations are always had off the back of those projections, right? Showing them what the impact of these decisions are making. Um, you know, ethical funds, the ethical discussion. Yep. It's a big discussion. It's a real discussion. Yep. What are you guys doing in terms of ethical investment options? And you can talk product if you want. I don't care. So, we we definitely um, have a lot of members that choose to invest ethically. Where the challenge always lies is um, what is ethical for one person may not necessarily be yeah. You know, ethical or whatever. Of green. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah, 50 shades of green, um, which is totally true um so you know some of us you know some people come in armaments mining animal cruelty um you know diversity things like that so um we we do use beta shares a bit um so they've got a couple of uh exchange traded funds that 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 have worked quite quite well and are cost effective um but again it needs to be right for the right purpose and the, the, the the reason do you personally, in your own super, are you do you lean to active or passive management? Passive, yeah. Uh, fees and performance. Yeah. I think I read a stat over the last six to eight months that eighty point three percent of active fund managers have actually underperformed over the last six to eight months, mm. which is when they're meant to be kind of showing their their skills when when markets aren't going going as well. Yeah, I, I'm pretty. Um yeah, I, I'm I'm down with the the passive. Mm. Uh, I mean, I do have some active funds just for fun. Yeah, not that in, you know it's not fun, but just a particular personal interest. Totally. Um, but I always say like, just to kind of poke hardcore like um, passive investors. Yeah. I'm like, oh, did you know your index fund performed below the index after fees? <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Um, but it's interesting, like so those beta shares uh, do have kind of a passive, passive skew with those um, with those ethical filters and they've performed quite well over the last, mm. you know, three to six months because they're heavily invested in tech, yeah. they're heavily invested in healthcare um, and that's not because they're great, um, you know, stock pickers. It's just the nature of the... Mm. That the style of the fund itself, and all I can like the older I get, it's you look back at your life, you're like, if only I did that then. Yeah. Um, and we can't live in the what ifs or if onlys, but what we can do is say, what can I do today yeah. for the Glen of tomorrow? Totally. And that's all I'm about with my investing. Yeah. And, and what I love about my millennial money and what what you're doing is encouraging people to take a proactive approach when it ta- when it comes to managing their finances. Yeah, just be dialed in. Which is exactly what we're doing. Like don't wait until you're in your late 40s or 50s and go, oh, imagine if I did that 10 years ago. Just mm. do it. Mm. Um, and again, a lot of people do reach out to us because they're concerned about making the wrong decision. Therefore, they make no decision, mm. which may not necessarily be the right decision. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, 
Glenn was saying off kind of before we off air or whatever, we'll pretend this is a live radio broadcast in the 1940s. <laughs> um, if you do want to reach out to Fox and Hare, be warned, they've got a, a bloody decent wait list. So just yeah, so we're we've got a we've got a bit of a wait list at the moment. Um, but we do we're we're in the process of hiring uh, two advisors, an associate advisor, purely because you I we I feel like we're we're fulfilling a need, mm. um, ensuring people are making those smart decisions sooner. How do you get good talent? And if I am a good talent, how do I get out of the hellhole that I'm in <laughs> to somewhere else? Like that's the challenge. So we're going through a lot of interviews at at the moment, and we're working with a fantastic recruiter that's that's helping us. For us, the biggest thing and the thing that stands out the most is mindset. So our business is very different to your traditional advice firm. It is two and a half years old. It has grown from two people to 10 people, soon be 13 people. It's growing exponentially. So it has a startup. It's still the vibe. same place with the rooftop. Um, the rooftop terrace. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah we're still I mean, there. We're just yeah. there. We don't yeah. go in there that much because of everything, but yeah. um, we still pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, which is anyway, a whole nother conversation. Yeah. Um, but it's just mindset, right? Yeah. Like you want to be, you want to be an advisor that is looking to shake up the industry, looking to do something a little bit different, looking to work with, uh, you know, a demographic that t- t- traditionally has not been the ideal advised mm. client. Yeah. And I think, you know, my whole, I guess, mission, uh, in the Australia market sense, um, when I kind of, oh, it would have been in 2017, I was doing the Advisor of the Year competition with the Association of Financial Advisors. Yep. And my whole mandate was I wanted to make personal finance the norm. So um, one of the biggest mistakes I've made personally mm. in life is to see a friend out with her child in active wear and say, oh, have you just been to the gym? Mm. Uh, where it's like, no, what do you mean? I'm just walking. Like, mm. So the active where the personal health discussion is becoming the norm in society. Yeah, yeah. I want to do that in Australia with personal finance. Yep. And I want to engage the 80% of Australia who aren't getting advice. Yep. And then within all that, with the podcast, I want to get young people from their late teens into their mid-20s with good money habits without consumer debt. Mm -hmm. If you can get to age 27, 28, 29, with your good habits nailed and no consumer debt, you'll have a bang in life. Totally. 100% agree with that. And if in doubt, throw a couple bucks in super a month and get on with your life. (laughs) (laughs) And enjoy retirement. Not advice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's just finance and getting your money stuff sorted is just so easy to put on the back burner. Yeah. And that's it. It's like I... I've been saying the same things every week for two and a half years doing this podcast and that's where I've resolved I'm not above any of this stuff mm. and I'm just using this as a weekly encouragement yeah. for our community members to just, you know, you you run out there on the field, it's half time, come in and get some oranges, get pow out up and get the hell back out there and go get them. Yeah, awesome. So good. Do you want to um, talk about the community member of the week with me? Sure. All right, let's do it. All right, Glenn. Hello. Who we got? Community member of the week. We have Izzy. Hey, what up, Isabel? She Ooh, is. Can I call you that, or 22. just your mum? <laughs> is that appropriate, Glenn? Should I edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. We're like an hour in. Who cares? It can stay. Okay. Um, um, if you're in this deep, you go on the whole yeah, way. <laughs> if you're in this deep, you whatever. So we got Izzy. She's 22 uh, on the Sunshine Coast, oh. and she's a wedding videographer. Wow. She has a money goal to save 70 grand for her first home. Um, how is she achieving this goal? I have a monthly budget. I live with family, so manage to keep my expenses low. Silliest money mistake, speeding fines. Oh, so bad, isn't it? <laughs> so bad. You just When you get a speeding fine, it's just that like, I could have spent that $280 on a wicked pair of jeans. <laughs> oh, you have no idea. <laughs> I, I hate wasting money. I don't mind spending money, but I hate wasting money. And it's speeding fines or parking fines. Like, I've just, if I get one, it's really hard to get me out of that low point. <laughs> this is what the government need to do. All right. Yeah. So if you're listening, government, <laughs> shove your speeding fines up your ass, huh. but do it so it's like you get pulled over. All right, Glenn. It's a $300 fine. 
and three points. Or we've got a schedule of charities. Mm. You donate $1,000 and don't pay the $300 fine. I feel fine. so much better about that. I mean, take my points, whatever, because it's not about yeah. the more money you have. The Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Is that bad? I just thought of it. No. Because I've, it's uh, like... Oh, well, the I money's just, going to a good cause. Yeah, that's what I would rather. It's like, and it's triple the money. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I don't know. Because I would rather give $1,000 to a charity than 300 to the government. I'd feel a lot better about that. <laughs> but you saying. still lose your points, so things are still... And can I still claim it on tax? <laughs> <laughs> that, that one you might need to negotiate. But, uh, Izzy, thanks so much for uh, being part of the community. If we haven't sent you a tote bag... Send us a message on Instagram with a postal address. I'll get you a tote bag. Uh, I might throw a book or something in there as well. So exciting. Up to the sunny, sunshine coast. Sunshine. Seriously, Malula Bar, have you ever been there? I have not. You've got to, when this COVID when crap I'm allowed. ends, when, when we're allowed, <laughs> grab yeah. Liam, yeah. just piss off up there. It's just amazing. Oh, it's like this holiday. Don't piss off for good. <laughs> Come back at some point. Yeah. We actually did have flights booked to Port Douglas just to get some heat. Yeah. But clearly not happening. Yeah. I know. It's just, it's the war of our generation, isn't it? Oh, it's tough times. <laughs> <laughs> have you had the nose like brain tickler? Yeah, I had. So, yeah, Liam wasn't feeling too well. So, he was like, we've got to go. We've got to go. I was like, all right, we'll do, we'll do what we've got to do. I, I was feeling fine, but yeah. obviously living in the same house and stuff and... I, um, it was like up the nose, like it was intense. Yeah, it's like, like I was like, <laughs> she's like up there, you yeah. know, like, a little to the left. Little <laughs> oh, <laughs> makes me feel funny even thinking. Yeah, about I'm it. like, can you do my ear next? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where are you guys living? What suburb? Uh, we just moved from Coogee to Waterloo. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, you're getting into the city vibes. Yeah, just we can walk to work now and it's just a bit easier. Um, but yeah, love it there. It's good. Yeah. And do you guys, sorry, I'm just, Asking questions. Sure. Um, what are you doing with property? Do you rent? Are you owning? Are you rent vesting? Are you just pumping the business? Um, bit of, so we own in Redfern. Yeah. We live in Waterloo. Yeah. Um, pumping the business. Our longer term goal is we're working towards purchasing a new port. So back on the northern beaches. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Love it. Glenn, you are welcome here anytime. Thank you. And seriously, like, the months go fast and we're going to do a, a little bonus episode with Charlotte next who's part of your team I reckon even once a year every six months just flick us an email yeah bring Jess up you're welcome to come uh, and Would be love on the podcast that. anytime love what you're doing yeah. so so had a good time thanks man love it alright later later